When talking about names that have influenced what is considered mainstream modern Christendom, Clive Staples Lewis is considered a cultural giant amongst evangelical denominations. His writings on topics pertaining to Christian ideology has been deemed some of the most influential of all time, with a large following in both secular and spiritual audiences to this day. One of the most popular works of Lewis comes in his fictional series, The Chronicles of Narnia, which even garnered its own film franchise produced by Disney Studios in the early 2000s. What most people don't know about Lewis was his inclination towards occult teachings and beliefs, as seen in this quote written by him. Surprised by Joy, Chapter 4 I Brought in My Mind, published in 1955, by C.S. Lewis. And that started in me something with which, on and off, I have had plenty of trouble since. The desire for the predator natural. Simply as such, the passion for the occult. Not everyone has this disease. Those who have will know what I mean. I once tried to describe it in a novel. It is a spiritual lust, and like the lust of the body, it has the fatal power of making everything else in the world seem uninteresting while it lasts. This is not the only quote that Lewis has had that was questionable to say the least, but let us remember how it says in 1 John 4 verse 1, Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. When looking to his Narnia books, it is apparent that magic, witchcraft, necromancy, and spiritual dimensions are intrinsic elements to his novels. We can find more specific references to occult doctrines like Kabbalah, Gnosticism, and other heretical modes of thinking when we are delving deep into what his books say. Let's take the time to look at some specific examples found in his most popular children's novel series. In the eighth chapter in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where three of the four children go to the house of the beavers, they talk with them about the events in Narnia and the reign of the White Witch. In describing where the witch came from, Mr. Beaver says, But she is no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father, Adam's. Here, Mr. Beaver bowed. Your father, Adam's first wife. Here they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side, and on the other she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in that witch. Who Lewis is referring to, Lilith, the alleged first wife of Adam, is nowhere found in the authorized version, and something that is taken straight out of Jewish mysticism. Jinn are also extremely problematic, first of all because they are not found in the Bible, but also because they are neither described as angels nor devils, but spiritual entities that are found not only in Middle Eastern folklore, but also Islamic doctrine. To talk about Lilith and Jinn, both mythological figures, and Adam, a real man who Jesus' lineage is traced back to and is referenced by Jesus multiple times in the New Testament, is something that trivializes the historical significance of Scripture. The Bible says in Proverbs 30 verse 6, to add thou not unto his words lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. 
which can be plainly seen in Lewis's writings. In chapter 10 of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, called The Magician's Book, Lucy, of the previous Narnia books, is on an island with mysterious invisible creatures named Duffelpuds who cause issues for her and her crew. When she discovers a magician's book, she speaks a magic spell from the book. She not only makes the Duffelpuds visible, but Aslan, the allegorical Jesus of the Narnia books, appear as well. When conversing with the lion, she states that she did not believe that she had the power to make Aslan visible, where he states, Do you think I wouldn't obey my own rules? The Bible is clear in Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 to 12 that those who practice sorcery and spells, that all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. If Aslan is supposed to be a god in Lewis's world, why did God make these his own rules? The truth is that there is no white magic or black magic. It all comes from the devil, and God is not the source of this. You could only imagine what type of confusion Lewis is giving to kids at such an early age. In the final installment to this series, The Last Battle, this book marks the end of the world of Narnia. In this novel, we are introduced to a near equivalent to the devil slash antichrist named Tash, which many Narnians worshipped in its last days. When it came to the final judgment done by Aslan, as his creation enters into Aslan's country, the Narnian equivalent to heaven, one of these worshippers of Tash, Emeth, is allowed to enter due to his good works and motives despite serving and worshipping Tash. Aslan states in chapter 15, further and further up, about Emeth's worship of Tash, that, not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites, I take to me the services which thou hast done to him, for I and he are of such different kinds, that no service which is vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. If you put two and two together, the doctrine that Lewis is espousing to children is satanic in nature. This is the type of universalism that Lewis espoused in his book Mere Christianity. Other heretics, such as Origen of Alexandria, believed even the devil himself would be redeemed. This is despite what the Bible says about the lake of fire, where the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, according to Revelation 14 verse 11. This is an entirely different gospel, where Galatians 1 verse 8 says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Jesus said in John 8 verse 24, For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And where Peter says in Acts 4 verse 12, that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Galatians 2 verse 16 also states, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, 
even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No one is getting saved by their good works. It is only in Jesus Christ that one is, and to teach otherwise is against Christ, as Lewis demonstrates here once again. With everything that we have gone over, it is undeniable that C.S. Lewis's fascination with the occult even seeped through to his writings, which found its way into one of the most popular children's novel series of all time. If you do not have a problem with what Lewis was implying within these multiple examples, then there's a pretty good chance that you're a false convert, lost, and on your way to hell, if you do not repent and start living according to the word of God. God is not a respecter of persons, and if you love the Lord and his word, you will think twice about turning to Lewis's writings as any authority in your walk with God. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 to 5 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ.